Well, if you have a songbook, you want to turn it to number 36. So I look out in the uh, parking lot today, it looks like football Friday night gear. Thirty-six will be our first song, and then we'll have a our welcome this morning. Let's kick it off with thirty-six. The love of God should be familiar to you if you even don't have a songbook. Sing the first, second, and fourth. Since the love of God has shed priceless blessings on my head, I have made it my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule there alone. The love of God within the heart will kindliness and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God grows like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face. Since the Son of God came down with his love our lives to crown, he with us would remain. Greater love there could not be, Jesus died for you and me, in our hearts he reigned. The love of God within the heart will kindliness and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus. In his tender mercy, if the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God grows like a flame. Through endless years, it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face while his love burns true and bright we are walking in the light he has shown us the road we his glory must reflect lest our dimness and neglect keep some soul from its god the love of God within the heart will kindliness and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy if the heart is made his dwelling place. The love God glows like a flame through endless years it is the same the love of god <clears throat> will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face Okay, again, good morning. It's, I'm really kind of surprised by the crowd, but I'm really glad because I know some people probably think it's too cold, but sun feels really good. Um, I'm not sure about next week, so we'll, uh, and we're meeting this Wednesday. We're going to, I know soon we'll have to go to build in the building, but there's going to be quite a bit we need to do to get that ready. So, so informed, but it's good to see everybody this morning. And, uh, just a few things, uh, just a couple people we need to mention. Uh, Charles is doing better, so continue to remember her. Walt, she's out. Okay, Charles is out of the hospital, so that's even better news. So continue to remember her. 
Walt is uh, doing better from his surgery. So, and he's going through therapy, so he's doing better. Keep uh, Sherry Brady's sister, Donna Phillips, in your prayers. Uh, Jenny Paskins is doing well. She's uh, home, but, well, she's doing better, but she's staying at her brother's because some work being done at her house. So thank for uh, God for answer prayers there. Keep Michelle Harrington in your prayers as she still recovers. And remember, Dean England is Bonnie Lathy's brother. Is not doing well. He's doing better? Okay. Thanks, Sharon. I should have got some updates from Sharon before I got up here. Okay, well, I'm glad he's doing better also. And uh, we all know that Willard Hartman passed away a few weeks ago, but there is going to be a um, graveside memorial at Maple Grove on October 2nd at 2 p.m. So that's a Friday. So if you're able to make it for that, I'm sure they'd be a, a very appreciative. Okay. Okay, let's have a brief prayer before we go. Father, we come to you and we just are so thankful for the beautiful day and and uh, that you bless us with and this time that we can be together to encourage and strengthen one another. We pray for those who were just mentioned. We thank you for uh, recoveries, for those who are doing better, and we pray for those who are still struggling some. And again, we pray for uh, just all those that are away today and, and unable to get out of their house. and. And uh, Father, we just pray as, as eventually you move inside that things will go well and we'll be safe and everything will can just continue to move on. We thank you for the day and uh, in our time. In uh, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next song is 74. I love my Savior too. 74. Sing all three verses. Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to Him I sing, onward I go. Closely to Him I cling, blessings still flow. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior, He loves me too. Seek his favor in everything I do. Walking with him each day, love light does shine. Doing his will always, never repine. Kneeling to him I pray, thy will not mine. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior, He loves me too. I seek His favor in everything I do. Happy to serve my friend, lean on His arm. Rapture will never end, nothing alarm. Voices will sweetly blend under his charm. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He loves me too. I seek his favor in everything I do. Song before communion will be number 163. 163. When my love to Christ grows weak. <clears throat> Sing the first third, fourth, and fifth, 163. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to Thee, garden of Gethsemane. When 
my love for man grows weak when for stronger faith i see hill of calvary i go to thy scenes of fear and woe there behold his agony suffered on the bitter tree see his anguish see his faith love triumphant still in death then to life i turn again learning all the worth of pain learning all the might that lies in a false sacrifice morning i watched a movie a couple of weeks ago it was called the discovery it had robert redford in it i don't know if any of you've seen it but in this movie he's a scientist and he through tracking brain waves discovers scientifically that there's something after death some life after death he says he tracks the brain waves as they move into some other dimension or something so this is this scientific at least by man's standard scientific proof of some afterlife now at this point in the movie he couldn't tell you what that afterlife was like there was good or bad or anything like that but the world had accepted that there was scientific proof of an afterlife and what was interesting to me is how a huge bunch of people reacted to the, this news was by committing suicide mass suicides because these people wanted to go to this place now i'm i'm no suicide expert um but it seems I, my understanding is that most people when they commit suicide it's more to escape this life than it is seeking the life after maybe i'm wrong but that i would think that that's the way it is um and it got me got me thinking a little bit about how we how we view death and and so on and it was it was surprising not only um to me, but thinking about we, we Christians, we already know that there's a life after death and that it's awesome. And yet, thankfully, we're not all out here committing suicide to try to get there. Uh, as much as we don't, we know that this is not our home, that's not how we get there, is by trying to cut this one short. Um, but I, I was thinking about how people view death and, and I, thought about how much mankind clings to this life. Uh, I'm grateful for all of the medical advances that we have, that people can live longer lives, we can live more comfortable lives, but it sometimes seems like medical advances are brought on by a fear of leaving this life um, and a fear of what comes after, if anything at all. And thankfully for us, Christians, we don't have to have that fear. I'd like to read, there are several verses I could read. I'm just going to read two or three. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. 
1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where is your sting? Again, we don't have to fear death. And we know that what comes after is awesome. And we've got this chance this morning, like we do every Sunday, to be thankful for that. To remember Christ and that event and that sacrifice that he made that makes it all possible. That we don't have to fear death. Look forward to what comes after. Let's remember that this morning as we pray, please. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We are uh, so thankful for uh, your Son and his willingness to uh, be a sacrifice for our sins and give us. Father, we pray now that those of us who take of this fruit of the vine, which represents his shed blood, would do so in a manner that pleases you. In your son's name, amen. Pray with me again, please. My Father in heaven, we again come to you and, and we're again thankful. And uh, we just pray, Father, that we all, as we take of this fruit of the vine, which represents your son, shed blood, um, would be mindful of the sacrifice uh, that it represents and the blood that cleanses our sins. It's in your son's name we pray. Um, although, obviously, we're not going to send around a collection plate. The, you can drop your uh, contribution there. Let's go ahead and say a prayer for the uh, contribution. Our Heavenly Father, we, we come to you now again, and we're so thankful for the many blessings you've given us. Um, we're so richly blessed, especially as those of us who live in this country. And, uh, Father, we hope that you are help, helpful in, in helping us to be mindful of of those who are less fortunate uh, and as well as the needs that the church has physical needs in helping to uh, continue this congregation going and as well as to influence the world around us and to inform them and teach them about you and the hope that we have through your son father we pray that the money we we give and the donations that we the contributions we make will be used in a manner that is uh, most effective to to spread your word your son's name we pray. Amen. Song before the lesson will be 304, 304. Jesus is all the world to me. 304. 
Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. I'm sad to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trial sore. I go to him for blessings, and he gives him o'er and o'er. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sun Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I this friend deny when he's so true to me? Following him, I know I'm right. He watches o'er me day and night, following him by day and night. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend, beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy, he's my friend. How good, vibrant, crisp. Maybe we ought to stand up, do some jumping jacks. Someone has said that persistence is like wrestling a gorilla. You don't quit when you get tired. You quit when the gorilla gets tired. Today I want to remind us of one of the great characteristics of our God, and that is that he is persistent. He never gives up on us. He has been after you since the day you were born. And he's been pursuing you no matter how many times you have ignored or rejected or stiff-armed him, he's been pursuing you no matter how many times you have said no, and he will not quit seeking you until that final day comes when Jesus returns. God is the great seeker. And that's just who he is. There was a man who was telling one time about moving into a, a, new, a new home with his family. They were unpacking that day that they moved and they noticed that, that their dog, the family dog, little poodle, was missing. And they got very concerned that she wouldn't be able to find her way back in the unfamiliar surroundings. And so father loaded up the kiddos into the car and they went to look for her. They drove up and down the streets of the new neighborhood, not having any luck. And not far from, from the house, they, they noticed an older man in the neighborhood sitting on his front porch. Dad decided to change tactics a little. He asked the man if he had seen their dog. The man said, yes, she's been following your car for the last 20 minutes. 
You know, sometimes we can be looking in the wrong place. But it helps if the person or the thing that you're looking for wants to be found. And with God, he wants to be found. In fact, he is actively pursuing us. So if we're honest, we can connect. No problem. I want to share scripture together from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. In the last part of this long book, it's 66 chapters long, Isaiah is preaching to the people of God who find themselves in exile. They've been taken away from their homeland because of their sin. And God is sending them messages of great hope for the future. He's been talking about this wonderful servant that God is preparing, the Messiah, the Savior. And they'll be coming, God says through Isaiah, to rescue them and make them right with their God once more. Probably the most famous passage in this section is chapter 53, where you have the description of the servant who will be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, he will be wounded for their transgressions, crushed for their iniquities. He'll be led like a lamb to the slaughter. He will bear the sin of many. Some of the great things said about him in Isaiah 53. Of course, we know who that person ultimately turns out to be. We know Jesus, the Son of God, who came and, and went to the cross for all of us, as we've just remembered Isaiah is describing this event and preaching really the gospel of Jesus Christ more than 700 years before the events take place. It's pretty incredible to think about. Well, in this passage for us this morning, Isaiah extends an invitation to the people. And there's a beautiful and powerful and meaningful invitation. And it's in, again, chapter 55, verses 6 through 9. Let's hear these words. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts I keep those words in mind or, or before you as we reflect on these for a few minutes. We've got some visitors. <laughs> we really do. Remember where we began with the fact that, that our God is a God who seeks us. He pursues us relentlessly. He is truly interested in us and, in fact, after us in our lives. Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said of himself that his mission in this world was to seek and to save the lost. God is actually after us before we're ever after him that's the truth of the matter while we were still sinners the bible tells us christ died for us god is the great seeker the persistent pursuer some have called him the hound of heaven so that's where it starts but but isaiah reminds us today in verse 6 chapter 55 verse 6 that we need to seek God as well seek the Lord while he may be found call on him while he is near 
That's a very important statement. There's an important implication in those words. And I hope you heard it. The implication is there is a time coming when God will not be found, where he will no longer be near. As gracious as God's offer to us is, as strongly as he may seek after us, there will be a day when that will end. We will no longer have the opportunity to seek him as much as we may desire to and wish to, he will no longer be available. As we read scripture, especially in the New find out the time referred to here is that time that Jesus returns, the day of judgment, when God comes back. After that, there is no more time to seek. All seeking will cease on our part and on God's. God will no longer be available to those who have not turned to him before that. And so Isaiah reminds us here, while there is still time, seek the Lord. While he may be found, find him. While he is still near, call on him. And then in the seventh verse, we're reminded that this true seeking of God involves true repentance. Uh, that a person, in order to really find God, is going to have to change the way they think and act. In the words of the prophet, he says, let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous, unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. You see, this response the seeking of God is more than just saying some words. It's, it's more than performing some ritual or saying some prayer. This is a true turning to God. It's a full confession of sin and a full repentance. And the wonderful thing is what follows. And that is a full, complete, total forgiveness. Verse 7 says, the one who really turns to God will receive God's compassion and he will be abundantly pardoned. Underline abundantly. When you really seek God, when you really turn to him, you will not just barely be forgiven. I think here I address a bit of a flaw in our theology at times. I think some people sometimes we think that I'm just barely going to make it into heaven. You know, I'm I'm such a rotten person. I'm just barely going to make it, folks. Nobody is just barely going to make it. Nobody gets into heaven by the skin of their teeth. Nobody squeaks by. Your entrance into God's presence when it happens will be abundant because it's not based on you. It's based on him. That's who God is. That's how he operates. It's based on the shed blood of Jesus on the cross for your sins, and that is more than sufficient to cover and atone for anything you have done wrong, any sins you have committed. Entrance into God's presence is abundant. That can be a hard thing to swallow for a lot of people, though. You think it'd be, oh, great news, but some are too proud to accept that truth. They just can't accept such mercy and grace. They can't stand in God's welfare line. They've never stood in anybody else's welfare line. Why would they stand in God's? They feel they need to earn it somehow. They need to be good enough. Others, they just can't accept the idea that God would be so good, that he would be so forgiving. They know the wrongs they have done. They can't imagine that God, who is holy, would ever want anything to do with them. But the truth is, he has wanted to be close to us all along. 
He has pursued us from the moment we drew our first breath. He is not willing that any be lost, but that all come to repentance. And a person by faith just has to come to a point where they will accept that even if they cannot fully understand it. That's why Isaiah closes this text the way he does, I think. God speaking here in verses 8 and 9 where he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Why does he say that? I think it's because it's just hard to accept that God would be so good. You don't have to have it all figured out. You just have to accept it by faith. You may never be able to explain why God loves you so much. In fact, I'm sure you never will. You just have to believe it. It may not make total sense to you why God wants you, but he does. Just realize it's true. It's true. I remember, believe it or not, when I was a young kid, 10, 11 years old, and um, I had a neighbor friend about my age that I hung out with. He lived back behind our, our place. We'd get together nearly every day, see what kind of mischief we could get in. And he had this little annoying brother, quite a bit younger than us, maybe five or six years old. And he just would not leave us alone. Followed us everywhere we went, wanted to do everything we were doing, always had his runny little nose stuck in our business. And it was annoying. I remember we didn't treat that little kid very well because we didn't want him around. We'd hide from him. And then if he found us, we'd try to lose him. And sometimes we'd tie him up to a tree with ropes. All kinds of nasty stuff. I haven't always been the sweethearted person I am. <laughs> We did all kinds of things with that kid, and but every day, every single day, he'd come back out looking for us, big smile on his face, just thrilled and excited, hanging out with us. What we do? We'd yell at him. We'd make fun of him. We'd beat him. Nothing worked. He, he always wanted to be with us, no matter how we treated him. We were awful to that little kid. But man, he loved us. And there was no logical reason for him to love us. And it took me a lot of years to see a picture of God in that situation. God pursues a relationship with us and will not be discouraged in his pursuit. He is the great seeker. He wants to be with us. To be near us. No matter how we treat him. No matter how many times we reject him. And put him off. And disrespect him. And rebuff him. He stays after us. So I just. Exhort you today. Seek the Lord. While he may be found. Call upon him 
while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God bless you and your search. Five hundred thirty-nine, five thirty, and uh, oh, they tell me of a home. Five thirty-nine. Sing the this song and then be led in prayer. Oh, they tell me of a home far above the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where the storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone. Oh, they tell me of that land far away, where the tree of life in eternal bloom sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day. Oh, the land of day, oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smile drives their sorrows away. And they tell me that no tears ever come in that lovely land of unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you again closing our services this morning and looking at the sky, looking at that cloudless sky and dreaming about what that will be like someday, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on that prize and, and not want to cut it short, but, but learn from this life to prepare us for the next, Lord be with our nation as it goes through turmoils that most of us have not witnessed in our lifetimes, but allow us to, to realize that many generations have suffered through things that are frankly worse than what we see today, Lord. Be with our elders and our church as we go back inside in the coming weeks and watch over us and guide us. Keep us safe from illness, 
be with those that are suffering and sick and that we may not see here today and just help us to, to keep them in our minds and our prayers. Just watch over our nation as we go through this season, this, this election season. Grant us your wisdom, Lord. Help us to look deeply into our, our vote and our obligation to our country and our fellow citizens here, Lord. Just help us to, to be mindful of you and guide us in your wisdom. Thank you so much for Jesus and his sacrifice. Help us to remember that, Lord, and keep that forefront in our minds as we go through our day and the week ahead. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.